is when I became president of a Rotary Club, it was the first time the club ever had to buy a sound system so people could hear me talk. And that kind of set the tone for my speaking from that point forward. You know how time compresses as you get older? Things kind of wrap together. Trying to put dates to things, I found, was a very difficult situation to do. Gary already covered part of my background, but I wanted to add one more item. In uh, Subsequent to the sale of the State Bank in 1987, I did a little management consulting, but in 1990, I had a group of people uh, approach me that I'd known for a number of years about a young man from Kingman who wanted to start a bank in Lake Havasu City. And uh, I was kind of dubious about it. Then I met the young man, and uh, he's sitting here today. His name is Jerry. And Jerry kicked off the Mojave State Bank, which I had the pleasure of assisting him in that startup. And when Jerry elected to go to a larger bank in Fountain Hills, I got the pleasure of being an interim president, which interim lasted for about five years, a little longer than I anticipated at the time. I'm happy to see Jerry back in Lake Havasu City, uh, one of the best bankers I've known in my career. Uh, I'm sure there are people here that, yeah, I'm not sure anybody got here much earlier than I did. Floyd, when did you get here? 69. 69. Anyhow, Lake Havasu City back in uh, 69, 70, was a one-way in stop. There was no road going south because they hadn't built the Bill Williams Bridge. So if you're coming to Lake Havasu City back then, you had to travel over an old highway. And I think what they'd done when they built the highway coming into Havasu, they had taken a bulldozer, ran it over the hills, through the washes, they hadn't graded anything level, and then they just had a, a truck laying pavement behind that bulldozer. It was quite a ride coming into Lake Havasu City. Uh, uh, any of you who were here back then can remember every time you took that road, you, it was a bit interesting. You'd come up, go over a wash, you'd come up to the top of a hill, and suddenly there was no road in front of you because the road turned at the top of the hill. So we went through that for a period of time. Lake Havasu City didn't have, wasn't a city, wasn't a town for, oh, until, what, about 1980? Prior to that time, we were governed by a uh, irrigation district, Charlie Royal. I'm sure a lot of you remember, well, not a lot of you, some of you remember Charlie Royal. Because he was in office for probably 12, 15 years. Uh, the other governing entity of Lake Havasu City, which seems strange to talk about, was the Chamber of Commerce. Chamber of Commerce was one of the most important institutions in Lake Havasu City at that point in time is it brought the business community together on issues of the entire community. you got to remember, McCulloch was selling land. They had bulldozed off all of the vegetation that was previously there to set up land for sale. And so you got here, and with the exception of the initial nine-hole golf course they had, there were no trees. Uh, trees were something unheard of. In fact, that's why the golf course was so popular, because they put uh, palm trees in the golf course. And you could come out to the Nautical Inn and look back at Lake Havasu City, and the only green spot was that golf course for nine holes. So they got the other nine holes open, I don't know, a few years after I got here. For a lot of reasons, the 
starting life over from a divorce or from a bankruptcy or just wanting to have a new life. And Havasu is built on a dream. And that dream was initiated by Bob McCullough and C.V. Woods. The dream of what could be in the future. And that's the only reason anybody ever came to Havasu, was that dream, because they bought into the dream, they believed in it. And uh, I think most of us were right. Actually, the year as president, I'm going to go back to when the club first started. Uh, we were initially started in 1970. Uh, we were sponsored by the Needles Club. And Needles Club was part of the district for Rotary at that point in time. <laughs> Anyhow, the norm came pushed that idea to the club, and everybody bought into it. But it kind of got a little bit tricky at a few points in time. I remember, I was on the board as treasurer at that time, and uh, the board all had to sign uh, personal guarantees to our bank, actually to get the funds to kick off the original funding of the coin, get it minted. And any of you have looked at that first coin, it really wasn't a great design or coin, but it was the first coin. So every meeting, <laughs> we had every Rotarian had to take $25 in rotary coins. And they had to spend those in the community. And uh, so they give them to their wife to go to the grocery store. Uh, of course, we didn't have a lot of stores, so it was kind of limited. The other marketing concept was to put them up for sale at all the merchants in town. So makeups, most people made the meetings. If they didn't make a meeting, they had a good reason they didn't. But they had to pick up their 25 coins every week, whether they'd been spent or not. And I found out real early as treasurer, you couldn't depend on Rotarians who are managing startup businesses, running contracting, construction operations. You really couldn't come. You couldn't depend on them to keep track of what the hell was going on. Uh, they wouldn't bring the money in to pay down their account. Uh, Sounds like nothing's changed. <laughs> it was, uh, as treasurer, it was a nightmare trying to keep track of that whole scenario. Decided to try something new. We took a card table and went down to the London Bridge and set up that card table and sat there for three hours to find out if we could sell any coins. <coughs> well, there was enough tourism activity. That, yeah, it worked. We were selling coins. That kicked off the pub sales that continued years after that. The other big item was the uh, London Bridge days, which started occurring. Initially, when the bridge was dedicated, uh, Mr. McCulloch and C.V. Woods, this is in the summer now, this is not when we currently have uh, our bridge days. October, October 10th. he set up a parade at that point in time, and he furnished all of the floats. And all of the floats were self-driven, old cars they had bought and uh, they had paid to have real floats built. Uh, they weren't a lot of people towing things down the street. These were all cars that hopefully would drive. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, but we did sell we did sell a lot of coins. So that, that got us off and rolling. The pub sales then kicked in a few years later. I can always remember my year as president of the Rotary Club. Uh, I 
because I had three things that happened that year. My first child was born, I became a father. Uh, I became a president of Mojave State Bank, and I was president of the Rotary Club. And it made for a very interesting year, I'll guarantee you that. Uh, you were the best mentor I ever had, so thank you. Well, I, I will tell you, for those of you that don't know, uh, Bob's legacy of leadership is really, really deep in this town. You'll never hear the things that he's done um, over and over again out of the goodness of his heart and caring for the town. So thank you, Bob. Scott, you had a... Could you kind of go through and uh, talk about how the meetings ran? And... Hey, but nobody wore a tie. Instead of a tie, you had a bolo tie. Anybody remembers the uh, bolo ties? Every male in Havasu owned a bolo tie or more. And you go in the bank, bolo ties were a common item. Uh, nobody wore a suit. So anytime you saw anybody come into town with a suit and tie, you knew they were either a salesman or a bank regulator. And in the old days of bank examiners, they used to like to do surprise audits of the bank. And they would normally come in on a Sunday, and they would come in to do your examination on a Monday about the point in time you were closing the bank. Well, in a small town like we were in, hell, we always knew they were coming, because as soon as they checked into the hotel, we got a phone call. <laughs> Because they had government, they were charging their account to a government account. And so we immediately got a call. So we knew the next day, see their big item back then was counting cash. They thought that was the biggest risk in the bank. Uh, so every time they come in, when you close business, they'd come in and they would count every cash door, they would count the vault to make sure that you had the right amount of cash in the bank. It occurred, they had to wear a toilet seat through the meeting, and it was the lid off a toilet seat. And we had one distinguished fellow, it didn't matter how hot it was, always wore a tie, always wore a coat, he was a good Texas gentleman, John, for your benefit. And he, he could walk into, I remember he'd walk into the bank, he'd be standing tall, and he would look cool. It was 105 degrees out, and everybody's dying of the heat. He'd walk in with a suit and his tie. He was a Rotarian. And he got fined one time and had to wear that toilet seat. And that didn't go over well. That was the last meeting anybody ever wore a toilet seat. It went on for about a month. Uh, you can imagine the embarrassment of having to sit through a meeting with a toilet seat around your neck. It was fun. 